In a previous video, we learned the basics of how the brachial plexus is formed. Now we will discuss clinical signs associated with injury to some of the individual nerves of the brachial plexus. Many brachial plexus nerves are rarely injured in isolation, and functional motor deficits due to nerve injury can sometimes be compensated for by other muscles, leading to ambiguous clinical findings. Most nerves have both sensory and motor components that can be clinically assessed. Note that sensory signs of nerve injury include loss of sensation, as well as paresthesia, which is a tangling, burning, or pins and needles sensation. Here we will discuss only the nerves that are frequently injured and that present distinctive clinical signs. These are the long thoracic nerve and the five terminal branches of the brachial plexus, axillary, radial, musculocutaneous, ulnar, and median nerves. The long thoracic nerve travels inferiorly on the lateral chest wall to supply motor innervation to the serratus anterior muscle. The nerve is located on the superficial surface of the muscle and thus can easily be injured as it is covered only by skin and subcutaneous fat. Serratus anterior protracts and upwardly rotates the scapula. It also keeps the scapula tight against the thoracic cage during arm movements. The classic sign of long thoracic nerve injury is medial winging of the scapula and this is typically tested by asking the patient to support his weight with his hands while leaning against a wall. If the long thoracic nerve is injured, the medial border of the scapula will make an obvious dorsal protrusion. In addition, injury to the long thoracic nerve may also occur during mastectomy, especially when axillary lymph nodes are removed. The axillary nerve is a terminal branch of the posterior cord. Shortly after its origin, the axillary nerve travels posteriorly through the quadrangular space to innervate the deltoid and teres minor muscles. After providing this motor innervation, the distal extent of the axillary nerve provides sensory innervation to a patch of skin over the posterior lateral shoulder. The axillary nerve is particularly susceptible to injury during fracture of the surgical neck of the humerus. Additionally, traction injury to the axillary nerve may occur during shoulder dislocation. Axillary nerve injury results in the loss of shoulder abduction above 15 degrees due to paralysis of the deltoid muscle. In addition, paralysis of the teres minor muscle results in weakened external rotation of the humerus at the shoulder and decreased stability of the shoulder joint since teres minor contributes to the rotator cuff. Finally, axillary nerve injury results in loss of cutaneous sensation over the posterior lateral aspect of the shoulder. The radial nerve is the other terminal branch of the posterior cord, and it extends all the way to the hand. Along its course, the radial nerve supplies all extensor compartment muscles of the arm and forearm, plus two others, brachioradialis and supinator. The radial nerve also provides sensory innervation to skin on the dorsal surface of the arm, forearm, and hand. The radial nerve begins its distal journey by traveling posteriorly around the body of the humerus to lie within the radial groove. The radial nerve comes to lie briefly within the flexor compartment of the arm as it travels across the elbow joint anterior to the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. Just distal to the elbow joint, the radial nerve divides into superficial and deep branches. The superficial branch is purely cutaneous and travels distally along the radius to reach the hand where it provides sensory innervation to the skin over the dorsum of the thumb and radial half of the hand. The deep branch is motor and enters the posterior compartment of the forearm by piercing the supinator muscle. Within the posterior compartment of the forearm, the radial nerve is known as the posterior interosseous nerve, or PIN. Wrist drop, resulting from loss of innervation to the extensor muscles in the forearm, is the signal characteristic of radial nerve injury anywhere along its course. Injuries proximal to the triceps innervation will also include loss of elbow extension. In addition to these motor signs, radial nerve injuries are also characterized by loss of sensation or paresthesia over the dorsum of the thumb and lateral aspect of the hand. The radial nerve is especially susceptible to injury in the arm during fracture of the shaft of the humerus or as a result of compression from, for example, the use of crutches, draping the arm over a chair back, or sleeping with a companion's head resting on the arm, hence the term honeymooner's palsy. The musculocutaneous nerve is a terminal branch of the lateral cord. The musculocutaneous nerve provides motor innervation to the three muscles in the flexor compartment of the arm, coracobrachialis, brachialis, and biceps brachii. 
before ending as the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve, which provides cutaneous innervation to the skin of the lateral aspect of the forearm. Damage to the musculocutaneous nerve results in loss of its sensory component, as well as loss of elbow flexion and severely weakened forearm supination. The ulnar nerve is a terminal branch of the medial cord. The ulnar nerve does not innervate any structures in the arm, but travels distally to enter the forearm by crossing the elbow joint immediately posterior to the medial epicondyle of the humerus. Once in the forearm, the ulnar nerve is paralleled by the ulnar artery, as they both continue distally along the medial aspect of the forearm towards the hand. Along the way, the ulnar nerve innervates one and one-half forearm muscles, the flexor carpi ulnaris muscle, and the ulnar one-half of the flexor digitorum profundus muscle. The ulnar nerve provides cutaneous innervation to the medial one-third of the hand, and motor innervation to the hypothenar muscles, and all of the other intrinsic hand muscles, except for the thenar muscles and the first two lumbrical muscles, which are innervated by the median nerve. The ulnar nerve is commonly injured by entrapment as it passes behind the medial epicondyle of the humerus. This results in tardy ulnar palsy, which includes paresthesia over the ring and little fingers and loss of fine motor control of the digits. More severe injury to the ulnar nerve during fracture of the medial epicondyle of the humerus or during trauma to the wrist will produce paralysis of the abductors and adductors of the digits and commonly results in claw hand in which the little fingers and ring fingers are hyperextended at the metacarpophalangeal joint and flexed at the interphalangeal joints due to loss of lumbrical and interosseous muscle function in the extensor expansion of these digits. Now let's turn to the median nerve, the last of the terminal branches of the brachial plexus. Like the ulnar nerve, the median nerve supplies no structures in the arm. The median nerve crosses the elbow medial to the tendon of biceps brachii, accompanied by the brachial artery. Shortly after entering the forearm, the median nerve gives off the anterior interosseous nerve, or AIN, which dives deep to lie along the interosseous membrane. The AIN and the median nerve proper provide motor innervation to all of the flexor compartment muscles of the forearm, except for flexor carpi ulnaris and the ulnar one-half of flexor digitorum profundus, which are supplied by the ulnar nerve. The AIN ends in the distal forearm and does not cross the wrist joint. The median nerve proper does cross the wrist joint by passing through the carpal tunnel. As it exits the carpal tunnel, the median nerve gives off a motor branch, the recurrent branch of the median nerve, that innervates the three muscles of the thenar eminence. The median nerve then continues distally, supplying motor innervation to the first two lumbrical muscles, before becoming cutaneous to the skin of the index and middle fingers, as well as to the lateral half of the palm. Median nerve injury is most commonly associated with carpal tunnel syndrome, in which the nerve is entrapped or inflamed as it enters the wrist under cover of the transverse carpal ligament. The most common symptoms are paresthesia and pain along the thumb, index, and middle fingers. Severe carpal tunnel syndrome may result in atrophy of the thenar muscles and subsequent reduction of thumb movements.